when I saw crypto, I basically just saw it as a money network. So other people saw this as like this crazy you know, coin, and I did too initially. But once I realized, oh, this is a money network, it's just like the other networks with the, you know, a phone was a communication network, Skype is a communication network, WhatsApp is a communication network, you know, Instagram and YouTube are media networks. That's where you post media and every, every bit of media makes those networks more valuable and more interesting to, the, to, a, more, to a larger group of people. Similarly, this is a money network. The more people who hold this thing and believe in its value, the more valuable it is for everybody else. You're listening to The Unstoppable Podcast, the go-to place for everyone to learn about the latest innovations in Web3, NFTs, and the decentralized web. Welcome to the Metaverse. GMGM, GM, thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Unstoppable Podcast. My name's Josh Gordon, I'm your host. We've got a fantastic guest today, I'm excited. You may know Sean from the My First Million podcast. You may have seen his tweets go viral on Twitter. You may be a reader of the Milk Road newsletter. I'm a fan of all three. Sean, thanks for joining today, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Heck yeah, I, I've i been following you for a while, like from, uh, I appreciate your insights on just like business and how to be a creator in this world. And then, you know, I saw your metaverse tweet that went viral, you know, several months back. So I just like to start off right off the bat and kind of get to know what led you to, I know you've been familiar with crypto for a while, but what led to you really like saying, this is it. And I want to go all in on this from a, you know, an investment standpoint, but also from what you're spending your time on, you know, writing the Milk Road newsletter. Yeah, actually, I I first, I put my money in first and my time in later, right? Because time is more valuable than money. So I I started, uh, you know, buying whatever, I don't know, like most people kind of in my my circles, which is like, you know, the sort of 2014 range and start small and just dabble. And then you sort of, you get more and more conviction over time. And then at some point you realize like, you know, why do I put a dollar anywhere else besides this? And, uh, And so, you know, basically ramped up investment over time. And recently this year decided I need to be spending more of my time there because the way I saw it was I wasn't around for the dot-com boom. I wasn't around, you know, I was, I was in college when when the iPhone came out. So I missed the early part of the mobile wave. And those were really like the kind of the two big waves, right? The internet wave and then the mobile wave. And that's where just being on the ground, uh, you know, you sort of couldn't help but have a ton of fun, meet a ton of cool people, uh, build cool stuff and make a bunch of money. Right. And um, so these moments don't come around that often. And, you know, as they mature, they get more competitive and they get more figured out and the core stuff gets all built out by other people. And then you sort of are trying to build the, the stuff that's missing. And so I just thought this is the this is the one that I'm here for. Um, mm. This is the wave that I think is as big as the original internet wave, the mobile wave, I think this is on par with those, is this sort of crypto wave. And I just decided that I needed to be more active in the space and how do I put other things on hold or you know, different sell other businesses, quit jobs, do whatever I gotta do to uh, be able to spend more time here. So I quit my job last year, which was part of an acquisition where we got acquired and I was kind of, it was, it was an easy gig, I was hanging out. and uh, But I just decided like, Anything that's not crypto related, I needed to put on the back burner. And so that's what I did. Really? I, I really like how you talk about, you know, time, putting your time into something is the most valuable thing you can do. Now, yeah. what, what ways do you think are the most like high impact ways you can be putting your time in right now? Like, I think you and me are both approaching this from a content perspective, right? Are you just thinking about content and education or is that, do you see that as your you know most high leverage activity you can be doing to start getting, getting that time in Web3? No, well, I guess I'll give you my framework for this. So anytime there's something that you're interested in, you have multiple ways that you can participate. And so I kind of break this down into, you know, you're, you're outside the stadium. That's, you know, you're not, not participating. Then you could be in the stadium and you could be in the crowd as a cynic. So a cynic is watching, but they got their arms folded. They're, you know, just waiting for things to go wrong. And when everybody's cheering around them, they get grumpier and grumpier. So that's like level four is you're, you're a cynic. Level three, which is getting closer, um, you're, you're a fan. So you're cheering alongside and uh, you, you're hoping your team wins, but you're really not contributing in any way besides you know moral support 
And then you could be kind of like on the sidelines and now you're, you know, maybe you're your coach or you're a assistant or you're a water boy or whatever it is. And you're sort of helping the people that are playing the game. This might be an investor. This might be a, um, you know, a consultant or an agency, something like that. And then there's playing the game and playing the game is like the players on the field and the players on the field are the ones that actually you know, like they, they're the ones who decide the, the, what the final score is going to be. And so as much as possible, I try to get as close to playing the game as I can, given the, the sort of resources that are admitted to me. Why? Why? Because I think it's the most fun. I think you learn the most that way. And, mm. you know, to the victor goes the spoils, right? So, so the, the person actually playing the game is the one who benefits, right? Like the fan, they cheers, they go home, they get the good feeling that their team won. But the player actually like, you know, sort of owns that win and gets the benefit of becoming, you know, you know, a, a champion. So, so for me, I, I basically was like, I want to get as close to the field as possible. And so I do some stuff that's like the coach or, or you know, person on the sideline, which is I invest or I'll advise, um, you know, projects that I think are really interesting. Um, but then being a player on the field is actually to make something in this space. And I decided, I was like, well, I can make something, I can either make something that's, uh, you know, am I going to go build a protocol or a DAP or am I going to like, make one of those or in my case I decided to build the largest um, trusted media brand so basically who do you trust and who do you like when it comes to crypto and I decided that that's what I wanted to build was the largest audience uh, uh, largest trusted audience of crypto um, uh, of crypto you know enthusiasts so that's what yeah. I decided to build with the milk road and uh, you know we're on our way Awesome. Yeah, definitely have some questions about the Milk Road we'll get into. I've been a reader of it and have found it super insightful. I think it's just like a great blend of education meets like pertinent, timely information meets like also some comedy and uh, just really good finds from Twitter. So I've been appreciating that, but we'll get to that in a minute. You, you, you talked about like you said, you missed the that Internet rise, right? Yep. I think a lot of us are in that boat. Me too. And I see so many impactful technologies out there right now. We, I was just talking with an investor the other week about, you know, climate, climate tech, we've got healthcare tech. I mean, AI is still yep. being like figured out and Im implemented into like applications across the world. But what makes crypto this technology that's like bigger than a, in a bigger than a technology like, sector and it makes it this whole movement that people are energized about because i don't see that same level of like <laughs> media attention getting put towards any of these other technology areas that are also world changing right yeah i, th I think all those areas are awesome and uh you know good people are doing all those and they will the difference with crypto um and i don't think this makes it better maybe you know, in some ways it makes it better some ways it makes it worse is those are just industries crypto is religion it's really religion meets capitalism. And so um, so it's a business game you get to play, but it has the sort of tribal um, us against the world thing as like sports and religion. And so, um, you know, I think that's what makes it more fun. That's what makes it more viral. That's what makes it more emotional. That's what drives a lot of the uh, the behavior that you see. And uh, for better and for worse, right? Like, what's a maxi, right? Like, uh, if I'm a Jesus maxi, I'm a Christian, right? Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a maxi of, um, you know, a Hindu god, then I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Hindu, right? Like, so basically, you, you see these religious and sort of tribal aspects um, in crypto, and I think that's why it just gets more attention and more play because it has a higher emotive, emotional quotient than uh, you know AI does or, or climate does or B2B yeah. SaaS or anything else. Yeah. You know, something I've been thinking about is just how interesting it is that now we can, uh, it, being a kid or just a young person or really anyone on the internet, you can learn from people all over the world, whether that's like YouTube channels, just your TikTok, TikTok feed. Maybe it was 20 years ago, the people you could learn from were like the people in your closest proximity. It was your family, your friends who you went to school with, your professors. And outside of that, like where were those resources? I guess the library. And now you can go online and learn from like people all over the world. But with what crypto enables is 
combining like learning, but also investing with people all over the world. Like we're these, right. we're these really malleable communities moving around this digital world, all investing in things. And I think that just that there's something similar along that education line, how the internet allowed us to learn globally and now we can invest much more globally and that creates community along the way so that's yeah a little I, bit I, of how i think on it i have a similar mindset which is that i've always felt that the internet vaporizes geography so what does that mean well if you if you compare um somebody who is you know in my neighborhood right before the people that i used to be able to spend time with they were going to be people that are in my neighborhood, they're in my school, whatever. So geography dictated friendships. And mm -hmm. once you started to have Twitter and Reddit and Facebook and Discord and all these different social networks, well now, you know, the fact that I am a Game of Thrones obsessed person, I'm gonna find those people not in my neighborhood, but in the, you know, R slash Game of Thrones subreddit or whatever it is. And so same thing with basketball and, you know, that's like, where do I spend a lot of time? I hang out in r slash NBA. Why? Because those are people who care about the NBA a little too much, just like I do. They're people that follow certain things and like to like to digest certain types of content and not other types of content, right? The, we have a taste profile that we share. And so the internet basically vaporized geography when it came to, you know, communication and, and relationships. And now it's doing it with trust and transactions. So... Crypto basically does the same thing. It lets me uh, transact with people that are uh, unknown to me, that are in different geographies, that um, I don't necessarily, you know, have to know and trust. Uh, but I can, I, you know, it created a new system that the sort of melted some of the geographic walls that came came up with where you where you lived, which is the banks you had access to, the financial instruments you had access to, right? Like. When I sold my company, all of a sudden, you know, guy from Morgan Stanley reaches out, hey, you know, we can let you borrow against your stocks at 1% and you could just use that to, you know, whatever, go buy a piece of real estate. It's like, man, I can borrow at 1% and then I can go make, you know, 15, 20% off this. Um, that's a cheat code, right? And like, but so you get crazy. access to this. The more and more, the the more you, you sort of progress, the, the higher access you get. So the more, uh, the, the, the higher up you get, the more access you get. But now with crypto, somebody can be sitting in Thailand who has no friends in high places and they can go on to Anchor Protocol and get 20% yield on their savings in a stable coin outside of their you know current local geography. And so that's to me something like an example of how, you know, once again, technology and the internet has is vaporizing more and more forms of uh, geography that sort of limited our options before this. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just as you said that I something popped up in my head that I want you to react to is a question I get from some people in my circle is like, how does crypto support, you know, everybody because and not just the rich people or, you know, how does this not just feed into this capitalist system that benefits maybe, you know, people that have advantages and you you, know, you listed some of them there's cheat codes out there, right? The, sometimes the more wealth you acquire, the easier it is to, yeah. you know, to lend and, and then invest on that. But with options like Anchor Protocol, do you see that just becoming more widely accessible in terms of just this global financial system and that the fact that Americans sometimes have a, a small view of, you know, because of the freedoms we have here and that a, lar a large part of the world might be able to benefit off these structures that are getting created. I mean, 20% off a stable coin. Um, I know you're a, a big Luna fan. I mean, that's, that's pretty unheard of, right? Yeah, I mean, it was just, it's very, very, very compelling, right? And so, so you know, I think that the question is how doesn't this help the, you know, the, the random person who, you know, does not have certain advantages? Well, you know, when I, if I go wanted, if I wanted just to use that example, if I wanted to go onto whether it's OpenSea or it's, you know, um, Anchor Protocol or whatever, you know, they don't ask, you know, I don't need a warm introduction. <laughs> I don't need to show a business card or even a, a, I don't need a KYC for half this shit, right? So it's like, not yet. You, you don't, you know, you do at one on ramp, but after that, you're sort of good to go. And so, you know, I think that there is a large sort of equalizer in terms of, geography of 
you know, your net personal network of what what opp- what opportunities are available to you. And so, you know, whether you're flipping NFTs or you're, um, you know, you're investing in DeFi and trying to chase yield or you're just you're playing Axie Infinity and you live in the Philippines and you're one of hundreds of thousands of people that have made money for playing a game, um, you know, play to earn, play to work, play to read. You know, there's there's a ton. There's this. Or sorry, you know, there's you know, play to earn and then there's like, you know, work to earn and then there's yeah. read to earn and then there's curate to earn and there's, you're going to be able to just do, do work. You're going to go into the system or you're going to go on rabbit hole or layer three and you're going to do a task and do a bounty and you're going to get crypto for it. So like, you know, there, there's where are the where is this good for rich people like i'm not, I'm not sure where, where that's where that comes from is it because of high gas fees is that why people say that i'm not, I'm not sure why people i think say that? people i think people see the high cost of nfts or you know they see the high cost of a of a token and and it feels like well you know a board ape is worth that much now well i'm out you know but um yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That's but, where you I know, think most of the I, I don't know how, I don't know who owns Board Apes, but I know a bunch of people who own Board Apes that didn't have a lot before that. They just liked it. They they were early tastemakers and they picked right. And you know, yeah. so yeah, you probably can't. I bought a, buy a board I bought ape. a Board Ape for I think it was like three hundred and fifty bucks, and you know, I I was kind of embarrassed to tell people because my friends I I didn't almost didn't want to tell some of my friends because they were gonna like you spent that much on that, and I was like yeah. And, and even telling my parents every my mom she was texting me like for two weeks straight sell that thing today <laughs> sell it and um but yeah i mean I, I was able to sell it for a lot more than i bought it for but uh it you bring up a good point a lot of the people who do have some expensive nfts bought them for very cheap and it's kind of just uh the information access is almost the most important thing now it's not the access to a bank or the access to um those lending options it's what information do you know before other people so and and i i think even that framing makes it sound sort of like you know unfair uh Mm because it's not like there is this magical information that you get to know that other people don't get to know it's judgment you know do you have good judgment do you have good taste and if you if you have have bad judgment and you invest you will lose money if you have good judgment you invest you will do very well how do you develop judgment? Well, you you play the game and you start to develop judgment. You learn, you read, you talk to people, uh, you make some mistakes and you develop your judgment. And so, you know, just like, it's like saying, ah, uh, Amazon stock is only for the rich because it's $3,000 a share. Um, you know, it's like, well, A, you could have bought it when it was cheaper if you thought that, oh, wow, Amazon has a really powerful business model in a growing space and it's going to do a position to do very well as the category leader. You know, if you knew those three things 10 years ago, you could have bought it for, you know, five or 10 times cheaper than it is today. Um, and, and, And that was in 2010. That wasn't even, you know, Amazon's been out for 15 years at that point. So you didn't even have to be that early. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I don't think it's secret information. I think it's judgment and judgment gets you paid in all areas of business, including in crypto. Mm, I like that. And I'd say that also really hits on the the value of what you're bringing to the space through, you know, a media brand, helping people build that judgment through, you know, content, education, timely information. Um, yeah, but like so- my, my thought process was this. I was like, how did I get any, how did I even get into crypto? And then how did I get, any gains from this thing, right? Where did I make all this money from? And it was very simple, which is my smart friend who I used to work with, right? This guy Furcon, he used to, t- he was, you know, telling me about all this stuff. And at first I blew him off and I was like, you know, he's telling me about the you know, Ethereum ICO and he's putting, you know, a couple thousand bucks into it. And I thought, you're crazy. I mean, that's a weird name. I've never heard of that. I, I don't understand this. And so, you know, from there, I started to over time realize, hey, this guy might might be onto something. He's he's really touched into something cool. Uh, he would explain to me what a DAO is. He would show me cool examples every day. He would say, hey, we've checked this out. I said, no, I've never heard of that. Where'd you find this? Oh yeah, you know, I'm just deep in, I'm knee deep in it. So I'll just show you the cool stuff. And I used to eat, literally schedule one hour a week with him, which was just called show and tell, where he would just show me cool shit and I would just ask him questions. He would just tell me, you know, wh- why he thinks this is cool, what he's doing with it. He would do a demo and show me how it works. And I just thought that was the coolest shit. And that's how I did my first, you know, ever, you know, DeFi loan and borrow and, and stake. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't even understand what these terms were, but it sent me down my path of learning. So I basically wanted to productize that. I was like, cool. That, lucky for me, I have a friend like him, but most people don't have a friend like them uh, who's going to take the time and do that. And so I basically was like, let me build a newsletter 
that's like that friend every day that's going to just say, hey, have you checked this out? And it's going to show you three or four cool things or to show you a couple, you know, little bits of information that will make you smarter or make you laugh and show you something cool. And it will explain why it's interesting uh, without trying to sell you something or just shill some random product. It's just saying, hey, I think this is interesting and here's why. And then from there, you can you know go further if you want or just say, cool, like, thanks for putting it on my radar. And then you, you carry on with your day and then that adds up over time. So that's what I wanted to be. You know, you're no bullshit trusted friend. Totally. Yeah. No, having that trusted friend is, is such a great resource. Um, I've, so we kind of talked about crypto and your belief in the overarching space. And I've heard you talk about network effects and how you you like to bet early on network effects that are going through adoption curves. Yep. And I want to know if that extends, like if your if your crypto belief extends to NFTs in the metaverse and like I guess broader Web three, you know, decentralized application technology, or does it really lie within more of like the token and coins? Yeah. So the network effect. So for those who don't aren't, aren't fully locked in on the concept, basically, um, in business. The most valuable businesses in the world are ones that have what's called a positive flywheel or a positive reinforcement loop. So let's um, let's just take a you know a simple example. What's a, what's a simple example of this? Uh, okay, let's say I um, let's say I every time that I um, okay, so let's just take uh, you know a telephone system. So a telephone system where I have, where there's one phone and I have it in my house, that phone is kind of useless because who am I going to call? There's nobody else around. And then my neighbor gets a, a phone and that's pretty cool. Now, whenever I want to talk to my neighbor, I don't have to walk over to their house. I can just use the phone. But the phone, you know, doesn't work with my mom and my coworkers and everybody else. But then every single person who gets a, gets a phone makes everybody else's phone more valuable for them because it's just a new person that they can reach. And so... How does that play out? Well, that played out in services like Skype or Zoom or um, you know WhatsApp or whatever. Every single person who got the phone then made the phone more useful to everybody else, right? Everybody, every person who gets the app makes makes the app more useful to everybody else, and so you see this everywhere, um, you know. Yeah. And, and there's all different types of flavors and 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 whatnot with this. If you want to go get your PhD in network effects, go read. Uh, um, the guys at NFX, it's just NFX, just Google NFX network effects. Um, and they have a guide of like, you know, the 16 types of network effects or whatever. If, for example, Uber is a network effect. The more drivers that come on the network, the faster the pickup times, like you push the button, there's more likely to be a driver near you. And that brings on more riders. The more riders there are, the more utilization the drivers get, the more money they make per hour and the lower the cost per ride. And yeah. so it's like, you know, the every driver that joins, drives the network effect to be more valuable. So the same is true, you know, when I saw crypto, I basically just saw it as a money network. So other people saw this as like this crazy, you know, coin, and I did too initially. But once I realized, oh, this is a money network, it's just like the other networks with, a, you know, a phone was a communication network, Skype is a communication network, WhatsApp is a communication network, you know, Instagram and YouTube are media networks. That's where you post media and every every bit of media makes those networks more valuable and more interesting to the to a more, to a larger group of people. Similarly, this is a money network. The more people who hold this thing and believe in its value, the more valuable it is for everybody else. So when it comes to NFTs, um, that to me is one of the reasons why Ethereum is more valuable or whatever platform is the NFT, like the dominant NFT platform. Today, that's Ethereum. So Ethereum is more valuable because NFTs make it useful for people. And so value accrues to that. Now on an individual project basis, there are no network effects. Uh, or very weak network, network, effect, network effects. An individual project like a Bored Ape Yacht Club is more like a Rolex. Um, it's actually the more people who have one, the less valuable it gets. <laughs> and so it is the anti-network effect. It is what's called, I think, like a Veblen Good or a Veblen Good. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. But basically, yeah. you can Google the definition, but it's sort of like the more in demand it is, the higher the price gets, right? It's like... It's like um, Normally, you know, increasing demand would, would eventually, you know, supply would increase and it would drop the, drop the price. Uh, but with these luxury goods, the opposite is true. Um, you know, the, the 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 higher the higher it's you know the the, the deemed price as a luxury good, um, the more valuable it becomes and the supply is, it does not increase with it. And so, um, so I don't think that that's a network effect um, style thing, which is one of the reasons I rarely, if ever buy individual nfts unless it's just you know for kicks and giggles uh for fun because 
I don't like, I don't know a ton about art. That's not my, my specialty. And uh, I don't like picking projects, um, like individual art projects like that, that I think might hit. And um, so I'd rather just own the underlying chain that people use for NFTs. And, uh, you know, I saw some crazy stat, I put it in the Milk Road today, which was that there are, the OpenSea co-founder came out and said there are more NFTs on OpenSea than there were websites on the internet in 2010. That's kind of a mind boggling number, right? Like, because he's the co-founder of OpenSea, I'm gonna take that as a, a legit source uh, yeah. for somebody who, who would say that. That's a crazy stat to me. What, what does that tell you? It tells me two things. One, NFTs are, the good side is, wow, NFTs are really like in demand, right? Like the the NFTs are, are are like at they seem fringe and niche, but they're actually you know at, at a significant scale at least in one metric, which is number of NFTs. Not the best metric, but it's one metric. Yeah. The second thing is, well, there's some downsides. NFTs are valuable because they're scarce. They're scarce digital assets, right? You want a rare NFT, but if there's more NFTs than websites, that means there's an abundance of rarity. So there's like a huge number of rare things. <laughs> and that actually means that most of these NFTs are gonna be like most websites. They're gonna have zero traffic and have zero value. And so you kinda gotta know that going in. Um, so that's the, the the downside. It cuts both ways of that stat. Gotcha. No, super interesting. Um, it Right now, I also feel like we haven't even seen, you know, how many NFTs are gonna be out there. We're, we've gone through these waves and just someone who's been in it for the last year, which feels like a long time and is a long time in the nft world it you've seen it go from art to like profile pictures to gaming music and once we start getting into this space where nfts are more used for common everyday things like whether that's card titles or unstoppable domains we make you know an identity nft i just think that number is going to continue skyrocketing and um and, and blow a lot of the make make for some really good stats right. but um you bring up the milk road and talked about one of something that you included in today's newsletter i'm curious from you are there like some top i don't i don't even want you don't need to list three things necessarily but is there a top couple of things that you've learned from just the creation of this newsletter around like the web3 ecosystem right now i've seen you one of the big things that popped out to me was just your high conviction in Luna. Um, mm -hmm. But you got to talk to so many of these experts. So I'm kind of wanting you to share some things that you've learned from your really smart friends here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. So basically what we do is like today's a Thursday. On Thursday, we just book out random calls with really interesting people. And um, so for example, uh, like just before this, I was talking to this guy who, who was the creator of Kickstarter. So he created Kickstarter, which is like kind of like one of those really cool like internet companies that that succeeded. Multi, you know, it's a billion dollar plus company. And then, um, you know, he's got a new project in Web three called Meta Label, and he was explaining how that was going. Oh, you know, what's the concept behind that, and how will that work? And and I just feel like there's so much energy, right? So the first the first big thing that's just like jumps off the page is how much talent is getting sucked into the system. So how much talent and capital. So like, you know, we do this thing on Fridays called Funding Friday on Milk Road, where we just say what, what projects got funded. And uh, every week we're like, yeah, $600 million worth of funding got announced. It's like, it's like this absurd number. Um, it's like, wow, that is a huge amount of capital. And then all those companies are going to go hire a bunch of people to try to like build out their products and scale their products. And so then you, and then you hear about high profile people or founders that do, you know, the crypto makeover, the crypto makeover is when your profile, you know, morphs from your face to, you know, a picture of a punk or an ape. And then you, you know, you start only using, you know, GM, GM and friends. And, and, you know, you start, you start changing the way you talk and the way you walk and the things you buy and you become like a different person. And I've that's what's there. happening. That's what's happening to a lot of people. And that's what's happening to a lot of, so, the, so the, the brain drain is real, right? The head of YouTube goes and joins Polygon or whatever. There's just like every day we you're going to see. just saw a lead engineer at Snapchat go over to Uniswap. I think that was today or yesterday. Yep, exactly. So the brain drain is real. And this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So like what the, the core criticism of crypto is there's no real use case. It's all just speculation. Well, I think there's some merit to that. And then there's some parts of that that's not true. But like, you know, let's set aside that debate for a second because that's like 20 minutes of conversation. Um, the fact that you have, I think, $30 billion plus getting funded into crypto companies and then 
all this, you know, A plus talent, young talent, old talent, whatever, getting sucked into this space. This is self-fulfilling prophecy. They're going to build the use cases, right? Like even if there wasn't a ton of use and it was all speculation, the speculation was phase one. Um, and it had to be phase one. It was a feature, not a bug. It's what got a bunch of people excited because there was a prospect of getting rich quick. And guess what? That's a pretty compelling sales pitch, no matter what people, you know, uh, what like kind of the hipsters want to want to believe is, is people like that idea and they act on it. <laughs> and so... Um, so the yeah. speculation drove ado uh, drove adoption, it drove interest, it drove usage, it drove attention, it drove the brands, it drove talent. And then all those things create the next phase, which is greater and greater utility. And then that, and that will drive the next phase and so on and so forth. And so that's the first thing that stood out to me is every Thursday when I do these random calls, I'm astonished at the level of talent that has moved into this space. Mm. The, the, the level of talent and... So I just joined a Web3 company in January, and it's been amazing to kind of see the inside of a company and the people that we're hiring to, and like that energy. You, I see it on Twitter a lot, but now that I get to see it every day in, in Slack and you know company updates, kind and of. And you're talking about reports. Unstoppable, right? Yeah, talking about so, Unstoppable. So, so the the who's the CMO of Unstoppable? The chief marketing officer. I think I think he's the chief marketing officer. It's that guy. Are you Matt, talking right? about? Are you talking about um, Ren or? I, I sorry, that guy Matt, the guy who built uh, oh, Nine Nine Matt, Designs. Yeah, and, yeah. We we have like five Matts in our like C suite. Um, yeah, Matt. I want to. I'm gonna pronounce his last name wrong. We call him Matt M. Yeah. So Matt. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah. So yeah. that guy, you know, he was the founder of Ninety Nine Designs, right? And he was the yeah. founder of I think Hired or something. Some other like. Some I want to say Flippa. Yeah, maybe Flippa as well. I think he's done three projects that are like kind of like internet, like big wins. And uh, so anytime somebody like that takes a job, it's like that guy doesn't need to take a job. That guy could start a company, self-fund it, or raise any amount of money to do any idea that's half-baked in his brain at this point. For them to take a job is like indicative of how big this opportunity is because that's not what somebody who has that track record would do otherwise. Yeah, Totally. And just for clarification on the pod, uh, Matt, it's Matt Mikowitz, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. So sorry, Matt. Um, but Chief Revenue Officer. Chief Revenue Officer. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, totally. So, you know, I appreciate that breakdown from you. Um, I want, I, so we got about six minutes left of the podcast. I want to ask you a couple random uh, crypto ideas and just bounce them off of you. See what see what you have to say and right, hear from you if you fire. have any that Great. pop up in your head. But first one, um, I'm thinking about the combination of AR meets NFT. So I've had this idea for a while. Like we go around and with Pokemon Go and these AR experiences pop up. But I want to be able to take a picture, let's say in Times Square, and then mint that picture and tie it to a geographical location in like the metaverse. So you can only view that picture on your phone when you like are in Times Square, because that's where that experience happened. And I think you can basically mint experiences and then make them location specific. Right. Okay. I like the cool, general idea. Not but cool. I, I like the general idea, but I think it needs more. Uh difficulty why why would i say that well like you know pokemon go was sort of this like capture mechanic it's like i gotta go into this fucking field somewhere just to get this one pokemon etc and um and you know i'm hoping to get a good one a valuable one i think you kind of want the same thing which is you you want to basically have places where if you take out your phone and you're in that place you could basically catch an nft um mm -hmm. you basically get an nft and the nft can either be useless or it can be awesome basically if somebody just made pokemon go but with NFTs instead, they would basically bootstrap a NFT project that so, is, you know, w worth quite a lot of money. Yeah. And on top of that, some of those NFTs that you can catch should be tied to like businesses in the local area. Like you should be able to catch an NFT. Yeah, it has some superpowers that, in that area. Yeah. That would All be right, cool, that, right? I could, I could then there. show that NFT in my wallet to the local store owner and I could get something and so they get foot traffic. And that's and then the further away you get from that area, the less power it has. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, I'm gonna keep thinking on that one. Um, that's a good if one. If you're listening and you wanna work on a project, slide into the Twitter DMs. Yeah. Um, another one, and you know, I listened to a pod maybe a year ago. You had talked about some business on MFM about a 
birthday cards. Like some guy made millions off just selling electronic birthday cards. Yep. So think birthday cards, but NFTs. I think as adoption grows, more people want to give NFTs to commemorate experiences. Like I'm going to a bachelor party in a week. I, I was like, we should just make bachelor party NFTs just for fun. Um, so basically it should just be some kind of e-commerce shop where you can design a card. Maybe there's a designer on the back end. Maybe it's more like Canva and you design it yourself. And then you can basically mint this NFT for free and distribute it to a couple wallets to commemorate an experience. I, I think there's going to be demand for more of those free and memorable ones like tickets. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, people do like if people do want to gift crypto to each other um, and crypto assets to each other. And also, you're right, like not everything is going to be high art. There's going to be, you know, things that are more personal or have meaning only in a small group of people. But I'm not sure the I don't know if I love the birthday card idea or whatever, because it's sort of like, you know, um, who cares that this if I, if I couldn't tell you if it's an NFT, is there anything cool about it? Right? If I couldn't use the words NFT, but I described the other part of the idea, would anybody care? It's like, well, no, because they're not going to resell it. They're not going to, you know, so, so what am I actually giving you, right? I think that's the, the, that's the real test. Try explaining the idea without, um, for, for any of this, for anybody with a crypto project, try explaining the idea without explaining the mechanics of how you're using crypto to make it work. All you could tell people is what the user experience is. And if the user experience gets them excited, fantastic, you got something that will work. And if the user experience doesn't get them excited, but you think that adding the word NFT or blockchain or whatever does, you know, then uh, you, you've got sort of a false hope. Cool. No, yeah, no, I, I like that too. Good feedback. All right, let's do one to Web3. I got three questions for you. One, who's an influential Web3 creator, entrepreneur, collector that's really inspired you? Um, that's a good question. I like uh, I like that guy. What's his name? Punk six five two nine. I think he's great. Uh, or he or she. I don't know who it is. Right. Like I think it's. I yeah. like. I don't. Like, you know. I've learned a lot about crypto from let's say you know whoever Naval or Balaji or whatever. So you know bu a bunch of st smart people I followed, Mark Andreessen, and whoever who got excited about crypto early on, and that was great. But I think every new industry has its own influencers that get born and created there its own native brands and uh so i picked one that was uh a native brand one that didn't exist before this but came on my radar yep. and um i just find to be you know entertaining and insightful um you know to follow on twitter yeah back to back days i recorded a pod yesterday also punk 6529 was the answer there and also so you know naval and balaji are both early investors in unstoppable so shout out to them <laughs> And second question is favorite NFT, and I'll I'll extend favorite token to you too, since you don't dabble in the NFT world. No, I'll do I'll do an NFT. I'll give you that. Um, Boss Logic is an artist who I had been following on Instagram for a while. Does amazing art, and so he made when Kobe died, he made a Kobe Bryant. Um, mm -hmm. Mamba Forever is the name of the NFT, and it's a picture of Kobe Bryant shooting a fadeaway, and then like on kind of like where he's the direction he's shooting, he's like wearing his Lakers jersey, and he looks you know human. It's like a human world, and then kind of like as he's as he's fading away, it's like kind of like you know heaven or like in a sort of an angel scape, and uh, it's just it's got it's very subtle, very well done, art's amazing. It was the first NFT I ever bought. It was the biggest. You know, I bought it for eight hundred bucks. I sold it for ten grand the next month, and I was like, wow, this is uh, uh, this is awesome. And actually, it's the only NFT that I made a profit on that I regret selling. I kind of wish I still owned it. I might go buy it back uh, because I just really love the art. Cool. That's a great answer. And last question is, what is something in five years that we're going to be doing in the metaverse that we're not even talking or thinking about yet? And I know it's a hard question that I'm asking you to answer with, you know, short amount of time. So anybody who's read my metaverse uh, thread, which, which got like weirdly viral. Like I didn't think it would, but that thing's been seen like almost 50 million times now. It's been read almost 50 million times. And um, that thread, I basically say that the metaverse is not like a place. I think people use this phrase. It's like back in the day, people used to call the internet, the, the information super highway or like the cyber, the cyberspace. I was like, what is, what is the cyberspace? We don't, nobody says that uh, anymore. And so I think that's kind of what the metaverse is. But to me, it describes not a place, but a moment in time, like a tipping point. And the tipping point is like, well, today, like 
you know, we have this, you know, I now know you only digitally. And um, I have a ton of friends that I just text or people I like on Twitter that I feel they're my mentors, my teachers, and they don't even know me, right? And we've never met in real life and we never will. And so a bunch of our communication has gone digital. A bunch of our learning has gone digital. A bunch of our media and photos and videos and, and, you know, relationships have gone digital. And um, the more and more of our life is going digital and, and, you know, crypto brings your assets digital. Um, and so, you know, before the, the biggest assets you owned were all offline, right? Your home, your stocks, your car, whatever, whatever most people owned, gold bars, whatever it is. And now that's shifting to where more and more of your assets will be held online, whether it's your art or your digital gold or your, uh, you know, instead of stocks, you know, your tokens or whatever else. And, um, and so the metaverse to me is a tipping point where at some point are, you know, and for some people that's today and for others, it'll be 10 years from now. Uh, you know, we will sort of care more and spend more time in our with all, all of our digital, you know, lives than our, our physical lives. That doesn't mean you're not going to eat, sleep, and, and 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 whatever. You know, like you'll do things in the physical world, but it becomes a great digital becomes a greater and greater part of it. That's to me what the metaverse is. It's that shift over time. And totally. Um, so, what's the behavior that I think we're going to do? Um, that's a good question. I think that's a that's a very valuable question. I guess I would say. Um, you know, today it feels strange to, um, today I think it feels strange to buy digital goods because uh, you kind of feel like you're getting vaporware, you're getting nothing. Uh, but I think that's going to be so common to just have a, a library, a repository, a vault of all the things that you that you own and uh, digitally. And they're going to matter to you and those are going to be your possessions. And today, I don't think that most people have, you know, what's your most prized digital possession? It's like, I don't know, my, my Instagram handle, I guess. Like, you know, what, what, what is it, right? And so I think that that's going to become something that is like, you know, your bank safety deposit box or your, you know, your, your safe in your house or whatever. It's going to hold your most valuable prized possessions. Yeah, totally. Well, if it is your most valuable possession is your Instagram handle, then you definitely want to get an unstoppable domain. <laughs> um but thanks so much, Sean. I, I mean, great interview. I appreciate all the insight. Can you please let everyone know where they can find you online? Yeah, if you like this, um, you're going to love our, our newsletter. So uh, just go to milkroad.com. Uh, so just milkroad.com and then just subscribe to that. And basically every day you're going to have, you know, your smart friend showing you cool stuff, telling you about things a little bit ahead of time, let you kind of front run opportunities from time to time or learn something or have something that was complicated in your head get simplified for you. That's what we do. Appreciate it. Thanks for dropping the alpha. This was the Unstoppable Podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please drop a like if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe if you're listening on audio streaming platforms. A follow means a lot. So with that, we'll see you next week. Peace out. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Unstoppable Podcast. If something we said today resonated with you, please subscribe, leave us a review, and share this with your friends. And remember, this conversation doesn't have to end here. Tweet us your thoughts, ideas, or questions at Unstoppable Web. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.